Welcome to your sophomore year at the Tragedy Academy, where you are the teacher and we are the students. Together, we learn from past tragedy to lay the foundation for a better humanity. The only supplies you'll need an open mind and a sense of humor. So, tilt that chair back, talk out of turn, and never raise your hand. Because this is the Tragedy Academy and class in session. And I'm pure Scott. Oh, there she is. This is me. I'm very much the person at the party. My uh, headphones, huh? Where's D? With the dog. The thing is, I used to honestly believe I was just an introvert that was good at extroverting because I was like, no, I like to like to hang in the corner with the dog and like, you know, stay home and watch a movie and read. My friend's like, there's no way in hell you're an introvert. You're just an extrovert who has to recharge. Yeah, well, that <laughs> that um, that makes sense. Everyone <laughs> Welcome to the Tragedy Academy, a show created to bridge societal <laughs> divides in a judgment-free zone using candor and humor. My name is Jay, and today I am joined by D McBee. How you doing today, D? I'm fine. You can tell from the laughter. Everyone's going to ask. Come, come up on the mic. You Everyone's going to back ask towards you some what if you was want. happening right before you started. Oh, I'm going to let everybody try to figure that out, or you can try to explain it. It'll just lead. It'll just lead down a chaos tunnel. It's okay. <laughs> well, I know me, D. I want to thank you for being here today. D is. Um, she was a former zookeeper, and she's also here to talk about what is the. Uh, it's compassion. Compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue. Can you uh, describe what that is? A lot of animal healthcare workers uh, suffer from this. It's something that's not uh, as known. In the industry, I don't think, I think it's finally really becoming more of something, a talking point. People are trying to figure out why people, you don't go into animal care without having a passion for it. It's not like a money-making business. So why then go through all of your training and all of this hard work and time only to then just up and leave, even if your life situation hasn't changed? And so with that, and then with 2020 and mental health really becoming even more of a public conversation, this is finally coming out. And also there's a bunch of groups with former keepers where we're all talking to each other and and like supporting each other and trying to figure things out. And the older people, as in the ones who have been in in the group longer and I've done more research are like, oh, hey, by the way, here's all this information. And that's how I was like, oh, that's what did it. Even though I was right there in the midst of it, I didn't know. I thought it was just sort of me maybe like failing a little bit. But no, there's that too. So what I'm hearing is that we were unable to identify what was happening with all these people that were working with animals and the breakdowns. And I think there's a high suicide rate for vets and stuff like that. We got somebody coming um, coming on dentists. the show. I always thought dentists were the highest. Yeah, You know, I was always told to be a dentist because, you know, you get one patient at a time, the in and out, right. you know, it's a factory kind of thing. And I feel like you can charge through the roof because you go like <laughs> one one country over and the exact same thing costs like 50 bucks. Yeah, that is weird. <laughs> yeah. So compassion burnout, uh, yes. you could you could also call it. Burnout is pretty much like the, the summary of it. It's very particular the reason why it's compassion fatigue is it because you're constantly here slowly watching an animal pass on even if you're making it comfortable here's an animal that you perhaps depending on how long you've known that you might have actually raised and so you've seen the entire life cycle and then it's just a constant like if, if you do shelter work there I was more aware of it because it was like oh of course I'm gonna have there's an expectation going in that that is going to be an yeah, issue you have to occasionally be a part of yourself and like you know there's puppy litters and you're like oh man and uh, I don't know how how sad you want us to get but when you uh, go to euthanize puppies because their veins are so small you isn't quite I think I just got canceled you just said <laughs> euthanizing puppies for god's sakes it's not our fault the I know I know I like, understand what you're saying we're like, hey, you somebody has dog. to do this yeah like fix your dog no why would I do that fast forward a few months so I don't want these mother f- okay great thanks thanks and we depending on the state if the person brings an animal to the shelter to be euthanized that is their property and you have to do it so how do we empathize with the people that work in these roles because there is no way i'm sitting here having like a breakdown saying don't tell me about killing puppies because that's a horrifying thing we get it from but both ends we expect the people that are working in that environment to be like teflon 
or to be able to do it for long periods of time or not really expect because that means that we're kind of putting pressure on somebody to do it. But we have to learn to understand that when someone works in an environment like that and they're under that constant bond and separation and bond and separation in with the these background, animals. It breaks you down. You don't even realize it. Uh, it, it. It's it's awful sounding because I could only imagine you bottle feed. Uh, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of, you know, I, the... Saturday morning uh, Discovery Channel where they've got like the panda cub with a, yes. you know, or the tiger cub with a bottle in its mouth. And yes. you're sitting there like, it's feeding time. I know they make it sound or look like it's this great if and you pay fun attention, thing. There's one person, either the person holding it isn't talking and that's the person caring for the animal like all the time. Or the person's like right off camera and when something starts to like get fidgety, they're like, oh, look, I'll just take that because they all know you. Right. No, I'm <laughs> I'm talking about the the less than glamorous work behind the scenes of oh, a yeah. zoo and everything that goes with and it. how parents will walk by and be like, you see, Jimmy, if you don't finish school, you'll be shoveling poop, too. And you turn around and you can't say anything because you're on the clock and you have a company straight on and you're just like there are like 30 people who would kill for this job i beat out like 100 to get this job i have multiple degrees i will open this lion gate before i knew certain things about aquariums and stuff like that i can say that Everyone when i was thinks- a kid i wanted to be a marine biologist after i went to sea world the first time yes I wanted to so badly. Swimming fear, so that cut off the marine part for me. Yeah, also cut off the Navy for me. I thought about it real hard. (laughs) Oh, I thought about it real hard. And the Navy was like, oh, is the Navy like train dolphins to do missions, but still swimming? So I guess no. Oh, no, I don't know about any dolphin. Uh, I know that they do stuff like that or something, but yeah, I, I don't know how like how like factual it is. And the army has dogs. Now, probably heard it off of TikTok. I'll do the army. Yeah, Belgian Malinois and shepherds all day long. Oh, yes. Um, So when we talk about this compassion fatigue, I think that we can kind of bridge this over to so many different arenas, you know, first responders, medical workers, um, you know, military. It's not always obvious. And then in any moment when there is a moment of like realization in this culture, it's just like, okay, what's the next story? What's the next story? What's the next story? I'm like, okay, well, there, that is their story. That's their whole life. That's it's like the whole thing when they say, uh, in a, a non racial manner, when someone like, like a cop pulls you over and they're like, just, you know, be nice because you don't know where they're coming from. They could have just come from some horrible wreck where I worked with a cop who did security for a place. And one day he came in really quiet and he's like me. And I'm like, oh, why are you quiet? I'm like, oh, that's what that feels like when people ask me, why am I quiet? And he's like, yeah, nothing. And he ended up leaving early and calling someone else to cover. And I remember I, I asked his wife later, I was like, is he like good? And she's like, oh, yeah, no, there was a wreck and there's a kid. That's a real thing. I actually was a military police officer and I did traffic accident investigations and that that kind of thing, um, you know, for police officers. Said, it's hard to work through. Like, this is not not the same level. 100%. I was caring for a wallaby that I had not full on raised, but like came out on the back end. And uh, wallabies and, and kangaroos, they're a little prone to anxiety driven death. So if something happens, Whoa, like, like like you could walk up, scream real loud and they fall over and die. Yes, they're very they're a little too anxious. That's, like, that's a breakdown <laughs> in the design flaw. It is. It truly is. They can just work themselves up to the point where they just like collapse. And so as a lot of times they have a, it's a capture apathy where they when you're trying to catch them, if you don't do it quickly and efficiently, they get so worked up, their muscles lock up. And because everything locks up, they like can't breathe properly. So that's why Rocco would only hang out with a turtle and a cow yes. and some other shit. Because they had to be low key things because they might have yelled and he'd have been like, he just fell over right there. Someone in there was like, <laughs> actually, hold on, sir. My, I tell you that I read a lot of animal books. And I just want to put this in here. That's why he was always running away from them toad people. He's just like, you know what? I'm I'm a Rocco little Rocco had PTSD. Oh yes. Oh that that's been that's been like proven. When you go back on into cartoons and be like, I think this person was actually working through their problems with this character. And you're like, yeah, I really think all character regrets. development is mental and, health work. Yeah. But it can go the opposite direction. Let's I mean look at Heath Ledger. Yeah. Things like that. Funny people, they end up yeah. 
hurting themselves. Robin Williams, he, his his anniversary just passed. It's been seven years. That that honestly, I think broke about him way too heart. much for someone I've never met, and I try to be like, it's a celebrity, it's a person you don't know them, but he was great, man, and he was so awesome. He was so happy and funny. I thought, and I guess you can't actually be happy and at the same time be that. I, close. You know, it's funny. A lot of people, like for myself, I identified with him so much, and it really. Because I am a keep it on person, I've always had like this drive to keep the level of the room above a certain, you know, energy level. Yeah. Because otherwise I'll feel what everybody else feels when I'm in the room or, you know, it, it just becomes like I'll give into my own depression. I'll give into my own anxiety. Yeah. I'll give into all these things. So it's I like identify socializing with them. is meant to be like your cure. So if the people in the room aren't also like happy, you're like, I'm failing or what's going on? What's wrong? I'm failing. There, see, and and this is this is a dynamic that we don't think about. I'm failing. And that's with regard to the conversation or the climate around you. And how is it possible to fail something that you're actually not able to manipulate? Yeah. And sometimes your friends don't even ask you to do that. There's situations where sometimes they're like, hey, come on, come over and be the, the, the funny person. And you're like, okay, well, but, but you know what I'm going through. Why would you ask that? <laughs> if my friend walked over and said, come here and be the funny person, I'd probably <laughs> just fall out on the spot. <laughs> like, what, the, do what you is want, this? Are you trying like, to scar the people in the party? Do you want me to do like want? Some, some parlor tricks, like the arm hang thing, like the robot, you know, or what? I, I'm like, am I going to tell knock knock jokes? What the fuck is I that? Guess looking back, you, you, I sometimes give, you can tell you were invited because you're like, you're you. And if I invite D, oh my God, it'll be so much fun. And I'm like, uh, I just had a family member pass. Can I tap out of this one? And they're like, oh, well, then you shouldn't be alone. You should come hang. I'm like, no, this is a different kind of hang. This is a have fun hang. If you just wanted us to hang, that'd be cool. I just told you that I'm not in the mood. It's really yeah. insensitive, actually. And it's a drain on your well-being it just so that someone else can capitalize on your energy when you're in the room or, you know, that's and that's using you like a tool. It's a whole thing, though. And it's it's the whole line between like sometimes you're raised to never see that and it takes years. And then sometimes you can't even be mad at the person that did it because maybe they were part of they're a victim of it, too. And not so much a part of it. And it keeps snowballing like the whole. Well, uh, they the have game? they have a counterbalance. They're they're out of that that feeling themselves. They want you to plug their hole. I think your wife walked by. Yeah, Riley <laughs> wants to uh, head out to the. Uh, uh, what's your name? Um, uh, do, no, Dawson is the previous Simone Simone Biles. Oh, Simone Biles. The whole that... argument, and they're like, "Okay, I get it. I've been an athlete." Not at that level, obviously. And I mean, my coach used to say, sacrifice your body, you know, like, because it was tennis. It's like to reach the ball. And I was like, oh, yeah. And looking back, I was like, I mean, on the one hand, yeah. But also, like you, he had, had a serious football injury in college. And I was like, but sacrifice your body. And then, like, I can't do it anymore. Like, yeah. what happened to the chick from the 80s who, like, broke her ankle? Does anyone even think about her anymore? You, the way that you just referred to her describes the entire memory of I this person. I can't remember her name. Exactly. I can see her face. Is that Mary Lou Retton or yes. whatever? Oh, my God, yes. That's it. I can see her face. And when you remind me of her name, I'm like, yeah, that's her. And I can see, I can even see her. I can see everything. I can see her doing it. I can uh, see her looking at the coach, like, should I do it? He's like, yeah, I can see the coach. And I, for a second there, could not remember her name. The fact of the matter is, is it was her dedication to something that she enjoyed that she donated to us mm -hmm. with herself, her body, her mental capabilities, things like that. I preach this on the show, the, the mindful moments that we have as creators. A gymnast is a creator. And people will sacrifice, you know, everything that they can in order to appease the people around them. And only to find out. You can't. You can't. You can't yeah. because there's nothing to fill. It's their expectations is their own void within themselves. They're just trying to pull it from you because yeah. they won't stand up and do it themselves or hadn't been able to or couldn't when they had the chance or whatever it might be. Or they think that that is their persona. That's that's the problem. I get the whole like egging someone on and you've got to represent the country. But it's when it's when it comes from a person like all of these comments come from people who have like no athletic experience, let alone gym experience and who literally 
Dude, she flips. Like, I, here's what I'd like to I say. I can barely do a cartwheel. The people, yeah, exactly. So the people around, let's say, let's, let's look at the United States as a whole. And let's say all the people that were upset that she didn't continue to work towards more golds and against her, you know, her feelings or her better judgment or whatever it might be. I would challenge because they're saying, oh, well, she's professional. She should be able to do it. I would say all of you stand and try to do one backflip, just one. No hands. No hands. Just do a backflip, right? And I want you to do it stressed out, like after a car accident. She couldn't take her medication. They wouldn't allow it. No ADHD medication. Yeah. You know the withdrawals that people go through in that situation? For a person who's flipping through the air. I had a friend who was concerned about me because I wanted to switch to a non-caffeine pre-workout. And she was like, all she heard was non-caffeine. She's like, you're cutting out caffeine? There's a friend who was like, hey, you have ADHD, like seriously. And she's like, no, 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 don't do that. And I was like, but but for the pre-workout, she's like, oh, oh, just for that? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if I like totally cut out anything that helps me focus and keeps me even low-key under control in any way. Imagine if at her level she cuts out something she's been on for years. There are a lot of a lot of chemicals in the brain that require, you know, there are different levels over periods of time when you take different types of medication like that, serotonin and all sorts of things. And when you jerk that out of there, you basically you're unplugging a system of pipes. And they all start running freely again. And for whatever reason, you know, whatever that medication was in the place for, it's now just spiraling. And you have no way to to get it under control except for to either get the medication again and go back through that process of letting it get back into your system. Or, you know, you freak the fuck out and you... Sorry, I had a random happy thought. The screensaver with Mickey mopping up and then the magician just makes the water rise again. Oh. Forgive me. Well, <laughs> so, all right. And that's how my brain ADHD. works. ADHD. ADHD. That's how my brain works. You've said that you've never, you've never gone and done any treatment for ADHD, correct? I never considered it. Because if you have ADHD, you're one of those kids that like literally can't sit still and literally can't focus. And I've been an A student like my whole life. My mom's a teacher. I don't really have a choice. Um, so I, was, I would argue that that has no weight or bearing on whether or not you have ADHD. It doesn't. But I also sort of come from a community where it's like, oh, we'll just like, and she'll focus. So if there ever was like a moment of like, oh, just, you know, what what is this like B or whatever, just do better and get an A by the end of the semester. Like you're fine. You don't have ADHD. You don't need medication. And I was like, oh, right. Of course, I don't need medication. I just need to, to focus. So everything I do with the 20 different things I do at any given time, and like I do a puzzle while watching a TV show, while cooking dinner and not burning it and answering emails, and then just having 10 projects going at any given moment of the week, that's not ADHD. That's just, you know, being productive. <laughs> you think? I, I, if anybody followed even that particular stretch <laughs> of said, description. A guy on TikTok. Oh, I can't. He, he's the follow dopamine guy. If you watch TikTok, that's his thing is follow dopamine. He's the one who let me know. I was like, he describes what I just said. And I was like, wait, oh, wait. Oh, is that? He? Oh, my God. And I like so, said it to my friend. And she's like, yeah, I knew this about you the whole time. You didn't you didn't know. Oh, well, let's talk <laughs> with ADHD. There's a lot of bizarre phenomenons that people have attributed to personality defects. And one of them is that people with ADHD can have a tendency to cycle through their thoughts so much that when they cue in on something, when they're talking to somebody, if the person saying something triggers something in their mind that makes them think of it, they have to blurt it out immediately because for fear of actually forgetting it and having it go away because they are so in tune with you and the conversation to the point that they love that they want to give you this additional piece of information in the moment because they don't want to forget it. It seems so bizarre and it seems overpowering and it seems rude and all those types of things. But the person really is just trying to spit it out while it's on the, you know, while it's on the actual Yes, that's why my camera. phone's notepad used to have at the end of each day these random notes. And occasionally in the conversation, I'd be like, okay, but b- before you leave, so you reminded me of this one story of my cat, and I also want to tell you about this thing that's happening on Tuesday. 
Like, why? Because something you said made me, made, made me type it. So I just want to make sure I told you that there's a Duolingo meetup on Tuesday if you want to come practice Spanish. I know you were working on your Spanish and they were like, how would you know that? Well, you said it was your mom was teaching you Spanish when you were a kid. That's when I was a kid. I'm like, oh, delete, delete, delete. So yeah, the, the story about my cat, you were mentioning like a redhead and then my cat had like a red blanket. And then just, you can, you can <laughs> okay, see, so maybe, you can maybe, I, is like, maybe I misdescribed this. Hold on a second. I want to <laughs> back this up. This sounds a hell of a lot more like Rain Man. <laughs> It's like when you said pipes. Squeezed and, squeezed and pulled and hurt my neck in 1982 or whatever. It's like when you said Serious pipes, injury uh, report. The screensaver. And then when you said <laughs> have to say a thing, I was like, there was a moment uh, during during zookeeping where I would be like, I would just type notes like all day long in my phone and be like, okay, do I need to text anyone? This is all me notes. Nope. These, these are her notes. This is him notes. This is remember to do this notes. Okay. Okay. It's like a daily to-do list, but part of it was make sure you tell that person about that funny gif that you thought about, but you were busy working. So instead of stop working, we will put a note. At the end of the day, I have all these notes, like tell Robin about that funny joke and then show her this and then show her that. And then when you get home, tell Devin about the same funny joke, but then show him this and show him that. That sounds like a lot of work. It is. <laughs> Why do you do this? I don't know. I'm like, I'm dead serious because I'm listening to this and I'm like, okay, so all of these people in your life didn't know this information was coming. So they aren't missing. They don't have a gap. They don't have like an expectation. If you ask them, they're like, yeah, D always shares like these random funny jokes. I'm like, yeah, I thought about it all day until I could share it with you. And it was burning inside my brain. And I had to tell you. That's interesting. I mean, I'm trying to I can push it out. I can let go of it. But I'll remember that I wanted to tell you something and it'll kill me that I can't remember what it was. So it's better that I just write it down. And then when I have like a lunch break or end of end of work shift, I'll be like, OK, let's go to this list real quick and see if we can't mass text some people this funny joke. <laughs> or this YouTube you mean, video. You make jokes work, man. <laughs> Screw that. I don't want, Who wants to do that? Who wants to fucking... No, I, I mean, I understand there's comedy jobs out there, but I can't... I can't do that. You're like... And then I burn out. stressing over it. Like every two weeks or maybe like once a month, I'll hit a day where the alarm goes off and I just sit there and I listen to it. I, I know now, like this year and last year, that it's from the, you know, if you just stopped every once in a while. I tell everyone else, hey, you need to stop. You need some water. You want some coffee? You want to go hang out? But then I will not do that same thing. I'll be like, no, I'm going to make sure everyone else has had their 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 chill time. I'll drop off some 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 boba. I'll I'll like go make sure everything's okay. You're a nurturer. <laughs> you try to nurture your circle to keep them at a level uh, at a at a Robin them. Williams level. Yes, I need them. I feed. I'm a huge feeder. Not a cooker per se, but a feeder. Ah, so you you you're a good orderer. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times the friend who made me realize I have ADHD, I just be like, I'll text her, there's milk tea outside of your door. Because if I knock, her dog would get very excited. So I'm just like, I leave it there and I slink away. <laughs> so you do you do like drive by bubble teas? <laughs> It's the people that are not expecting it. She's very introverted. I know she doesn't want to go get it. And so Aww. I'll be like, oh, are you jonesing for something? It's at your doorstep. So all these things that you're describing, I don't see any defects. No, it's just. I see kindness. On. And that's why, I, that's why I have to keep it going. Because I'm just like, but there's no, what's wrong with this? I'm. That was a beautiful moment in her week. Why would I deny her that moment? In her? And she said, she's picked up on it. She's been like, you know, you don't have to walk the dog, right? You sound busy. I'm like, I'm not busy. That's, that's why I get you know, home from gym and take a shower and send some emails and then go by the vet and get my, my cat's pills. I'm, I'm a walking dog. And she's like, you don't, you know, it's not an obligation because it's not your, I know you love her, but it's not your dog. You don't have to. Like, I got it. It's helpful, but you sound busy. I, I can hear, I can see and feel she's trying to be like, there's your out. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I slam the door and I go full in. So I, I think you should start um, no. listening to your friends. <laughs> Because everything that you're describing right now sounds oh, like compassion fatigue. Yeah, I just transferred it. <laughs> you, you transferred it onto every person around you. I used to think it was because I was taught from an early age to overwork. My mom's a, a teacher and we would leave her school at night. Like there'd be times we were the last people there. And like sometimes the, the closing janitor would come and be like, you sure you don't want to leave? Or, okay, seriously, you have to leave. Like, I can't just leave you in here. 
and then I grow up and be like, is that why I do that? Is that why I'm always here past time? But was she there for a calling? She did love teaching. So that wasn't work for her at, you know, eight o'clock at night. It sounds like you picked up a bad habit in the process. I applied it to zookeeping. Right. Well, no, you applied it to everybody keeping. (laughs) Everybody keeping. Oh, that's a good everybody keeping. (gasps) You are an everybody keeper. I can. That's got to be a term. But, uh, you know, in order to be a good everybody keeper or a compassion assigner, you you have to say it. Take care of yourself first. You have to. (laughs) I do this. Because you're only able to do boba tea drive bys. I say this all the time to people sometimes when they come for readings and the reading very obviously says step back. And I'm always like, well, what do they say in the airplane? You put the mask on yourself first and then the child. And they're like, oh, my God, yes. And then Have I, you tried meditating. Uh, I try. It's my breaks aren't like slow. Now, I, I would I can argue- do puzzles. That's as slow as I get. I love puzzles. I, I have a thing with sitting still. You you know, you can't meditate wrong, right? If you sit there and you close your eyes and just do it every single day. I do nature day, walk meditation. That, that works better. Okay, well, there you go. So that is meditation. That's actually a... a actual form of meditation is I can do. a nature and walking and that kind of thing. There's, there's so many different monks that do it and stuff like that. Um, because bonding with nature is, is what we're supposed to Mixed be doing. Or, we're part of it. We're yeah. symbiotic. No one gets that. We're so removed and yet still a part of nature. Yeah. I think that is a, that is a mental construct. That's a, that's a, that's a disease. That's something that is wrong with us as a species. We think there is a divide between us and our surroundings and that we're here to accomplish something different than the animals or different than, you know, any other creature out there. And we're not because I would argue that we just pick up and do some nonsense for our time here, but we still need to eat, sleep, drink, breed, all the same things they're doing. We just do this other nonsense as our mental disease. Just had a thought. Maybe that's why animal attacks scare people so much because they remind us that we're not really that high on the totem pole. Oh, yeah, that is definitely... Just opposable thumbs, but even chimps could like totally wreck us. Oh, chimps will pull your arms off and beat you with them. Oh, do you want to know the difference between the four great apes? Sure. Every time somebody says great apes, I think grape ape from this cartoon. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's it's uh, you have bonobos, chimps, gorillas, and I am leaving one out. Orangutans, right? And orangutans are yeah beasts. Awesome, they're gentle giants, and you can tell them all apart by giving them a screwdriver. It is a screwdriver. There are different stages in evolution. So they have, and probably different types of needs have yes. given them. They all look at it differently. Gorillas will try to eat the screwdriver because they're not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> so they're further into the primate they're all, area. They're just so much brawn. Very caring brawn. Let me ask you this. Are they very loyal to their groups? Oh, yes. They're very, their family groups are so tight. So, so tight. I would argue that the lowest, well, not the lowest, good God, I would get myself canceled in a second, <laughs> that one of the broadest forms of that type of bond is patriotism. And that... Oh, yeah, you can't say that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a soldier. I wasn't trying to say it's the lowest form. It is the most common form. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. Yeah. The most common form. And I think like that it's linked to that primate, that primate level of brain. We all have that within us. Yeah. It just, I've always thought that there was a similarity between like how monkeys all come together and they support each other in groups and things like that, that yeah. we do the same and they hold, but they don't, they do a similar thing in that they can divide their patriotism between different separate groups of gorillas Mm -hmm. like we do. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have states that believe different things or different people. You know, it's super funny. They're almost just like us. Ooh, hold on. Do you want me to finish screwdriver or do you want me to segue into the thing you said about states just now? No, let's stick with screwdriver. (laughs) I'll put a pin in that. Okay, gorillas, try to eat it. (laughs) You, You have orangutans who will dismantle everything around them because they're very mechanically minded. That's why orangutans are like the greatest escape risk, not danger wise, but there's so many orangutans that have gotten out of so many zoos 
and just chill. There's so many photos of people like just walking to the zoo, take a selfie with a orangutan just because they were just like, look. And he's like, I just wanted to be out here. I like the mud flaps on the side of their heads. That 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 to me alone just makes nail. me smile. Whatever the hell those things are called. Their cheeks. Their cheeks that's their cheeks? cheeks? Yes. Do they, okay, so are their cheeks hollow? It's just because like, can the, you stuff those things the big with like, guys, they they develop those. Like it's like the big alpha like symbol. Like how the gorillas have even more silverbacks among the silverbacks. It's just the, the other boys they won't have those pouches. But serve it's zero big. functional purpose. <laughs> like awesome side. Or something. It's, so the orangutan, he is uh, mechanically minded. He's mechanically minded. Takes he, apart everything. He's slow moving too. So I kind of think that that lends credit to the fact that he's inspecting his environment more than he is flying through. Yes, that's why you have those videos of them like attacking the machines or cutting down trees and whatnot. They're very aware, very in tune. They're like, no, 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 no. What are you doing? That's not good. You're gonna mess up the, the, the whole forest. Like, what the hell? That's why they always depict them in cartoons or like uh, that, animated as like yeah, yeah the one that's like we're gonna go see the one guy he's like surrounded by like like a smoking pipe and he's sitting yeah. on like a cushion and he's meditating and I'm like so I get to, okay that was smart that was smart I see what you did there they have personalities I see what you, they're the man of the forest so what happens it. after the after the orangutan who do we have With next Nobos. Bless you. <laughs> fuck's a bonobo? Bonobos, they're like the hippiest of all of the apes. They're just like a, at some point in time, there's some sort of ongoing orgy and that's what they'll do with the screwdriver. They will use the screwdriver to make themselves. Bonobos are just the perverts. Of the, of they the solve, no, they're the most peaceful. They solve everything with sex. They're like, hey, she's mine. Interesting. But I saw that you were going after her and I sort of like slapped you in the face to, to win. But you want me to like jerk you off? Because we're still friends right? We're still- whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> they, they, they give each other everything. handies? They solve everything. They're like, oh, hey, I ate that apple that you wanted. Here. <laughs> Spreads her legs. Like, there you go. We're you know good, what, right? though? We're I, I can see how that would diffuse a situation <laughs> real quick. It, you know, like, if you were angry, you know, that would take Why the- are you angry? Have you not Stress relief. Sex? Okay, well, here we go. I bet they're addicted to the, uh, the cigarette Wait, after. Oh, <laughs> Whatever the Figure feeling is, after. I don't know how to describe that. <laughs> What's that? Post-coital the, bliss? The, the afterglow? <laughs> yeah, post-coital afterglow. bliss or whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> you just give them pills and make them stop. But I, no. li- I like the bonobos. They, they, they're fucking bonobo. hysterical. And then and there's then what's left. The complete 180 chimpanzees who will murder you because they're violent as fuck. That's the one that'll pull your arms off and yes. beat you with them. Yes. Why are they so mad? I'm the wrong person to ask. I can bring you someone who can answer all of your primate questions. Ooh, I would love to have a primate episode. Yes. Can we bring a primate? <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> Is anything going Come on, man, you're the one monkey. The only ones that I would probably be able to bring would then cause a whole argument as to why do you have that primate? I, I'm not going to no, say No, it's the whole thing okay. with uh, how... So you have to be very careful when you're like a zoo on social media. You want to be transparent because of the whole argument of why do you even exist. But then you have other people who are doing the showy. Oh, look, isn't it cute? I got you. So it's actually not good for them to be, especially a zoo animal. They're being kept in a natural habitat. There's so many animals where someone's like, look at this guy who has this pet insert. And I'm like, a pet what? (laughs) Wow. Yeah, there's some bizarre pet owners out there. No, you can get the, 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 it's not entirely their fault. It shouldn't be that easy to get. I can't get mad at them for being able to get it. And then the thing is, some of the people, that's how some sanctuaries came to be made. There's a bear sanctuary where they got a bear and they were like, oh my God, this was a mistake. Well, we are, we're committed. We, we got the bear. We should, it's like, yeah, I got this dog. I'm going to take care of her until she's old and look after her. And they were like, I wonder if anyone else has done this. And there were other people that were like, oh, you can take care of a bear. Can you take care of this bear? We, we did the same thing and we didn't mean to. And they're like, oh my God. And they started looking into it and they made a whole sanctuary. Because they become domesticated living around people. There's some that can't be released. They have some horrible mental or physical trauma. So they actually can't, but they can be educational. That's the whole thing with zoos. You won't care about the northern tip mouse if you don't see it and be like, oh my God, look how cute it is. Look at his little babies. Oh my God, it's endangered. Why? Because we're cutting down this one part. I should sign that bill and make sure they protect it. And then suddenly it's like, oh, look, now you don't really see it in zoos because there's so much places for it to live in the wild. 
And look at that. We don't want to be here either. We don't want to keep animals in captivity either, but we need to, to teach you to stop fucking with them. And, and also, you have to rehabilitate them. And also to rehabilitate. The, There's so many yeah. that just can't be. There's so many zoos that have privately, the previously privately owned animals. The lion at Houston Zoo, I'm from Texas, he was privately owned. He has no, uh, he was declawed. And the lady was like, oh, let's keep him in the shed. In the Holy back. crap, that's got I, I'm sorry. So first of all, it's a horrible thing to do. To I can't believe you would do that cats. to any cat. But that cat, a, you know, a big cat like that, that's a horrible People thing to do. People don't understand the but, way cats work. You're actually taking off like a knuckle. Why do I kind of want an open mitt slap from that lion. I feel like it would be like the most cuddliest punch ever. Actually, yes. The <laughs> problem is he then doesn't pay as much attention to the female lions to help any sort of breeding program because he's like, my keeper's awesome. Because people, and you're like, okay, yes, don't like kill me. That's great. But don't you like these female lions? And he's like, they're nice. So what are you doing? What are, what are we doing today? And you're like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> so we just we just take all the life out of them. Any of their ability to procreate. They the- can, depending. Like, I, I am, I'm not a part of his personal team, and I haven't been there in several years. But at the time, back when I was around and visiting him, that was their thing. They were like, hey, pay more attention. Not that he's trying to do anything horrible, but he's just like, yay, she's around. I'm just going to go lay over here where she is and pay attention to her. And so it's like, well, we sort of use you to also keep them in line. So if you would go be a, you know, alpha male, toxic male over there, that'd be great. <laughs> it'd be great for the breeding. So they're using the you to, to throw off the uh, the balance in there and yeah. get the uh, the male up Plus, and moving. Plus, depending and- on your program, if you're trying to release animals, you need more natural behavior. So sometimes you can like take a particular animal and like put it out in a program, but sometimes you need like the parents. So you're like, be be more, be more lion. Come on. Be more lion. <laughs> and it, it can take a while. Like maybe not his kids because they're watching him, but like the kids' kids, but the people being more hands-off and whatnot, they're like, yes, send them somewhere else where they're even more hands-off. All reality is a construct anyway. It's what you've walked through and experiences. That's why we can be raised with an animal and have animal characteristics and features and understandings. The guy you know? that tried to raise yeah. a chimp as a human yeah. he had to stop because his kid was talking like a chimp. Oh, it was going the other way? Yeah. It was, it was working, but it was working in both directions. He didn't realize. He also had like a, a, a little boy, like a baby boy. And he's just like, he was, I think his wife knows it or him first, but he was like, he's clicking. Junior, he's please clicking. don't throw your poo. <laughs> he's like, oh crap, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Oh yeah. my God. Which by the way, shittiest, pun intended, nice. of the habits in the ape world or the great ape, grape ape, whatever you want to call it world. Yes. That, that one is, see. You gotta appreciate that when someone's messing with an animal. They're like, hey, hey, look at me. Oh, he's like, all right, let me just. Oh. I'm gonna get your attention. <laughs> oh, no, it's not cool. I, um, I was in Panama for a while um, in the army for a jungle school. And there are the most disgusting, angry animals in the great ape world there that swing around through the trees are called howler, howler monkeys. monkeys. Yeah, I was waiting for you to say howler monkeys. <laughs> what the fuck is that vile animal? It's just that they're, they're brachial for one thing. So that swinging is more natural to them than just like hanging or sitting. They love to swing. And I guess it just gets them all riled up. Or it's like, yeah, it's just constant, constant movement. Everything. You're, you're in the way. What are no, you? What that are you? scream is so awful. They will. And if they find you in the jungle, they yes. will tell the jungle you're yes. there. Yes. They will throw poo. Yes. They will scream. They will do all these types of things. They're, like they're just assholes. They're like self-appointed guardians and no one asked them. But they're not guarding anything. No They're just them. telling you to keep moving. Yeah. Why are, you, why are you walking on the ground? That's weird. What are you up to? Uh, I'm yeah, sorry. You're just I'm angry. Human, but I don't like it. You wouldn't tangle like with one. It's got a set of fangs, like, you know, that are three inches long or some shit. This is why I try to be nice when I hear about animal attacks. And I'm like, not to victim blame, but what was happening right before? What- oh, it's <laughs> always, it's always the, the person's fault just for existing. Because <laughs> yeah. the, there's so many the, times. There's if the so animal eats you in a suburban area, the animal did nothing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the animal just did what the fuck the animal wanted to do and what it's intended to do. You just got in the menu where you shouldn't have been. Ooh, menu. You know, polar bears and African wild dogs naturally hunt humans. I believe it. We're pink and squishy. Everyone's so afraid of grizzlies. That's the polar bears. I mean, I guess if a grizzly was chasing you down, that would be scary. But you can you can sort of get out of that. There's, there's like a 50-50 chance, depending on the bear, you can get out of that. But polar bears, no. 
They're just like, oh, hi, I'm hungry. And oh, yeah, he there's no like making yourself you. look big or going downhill instead of uphill. <laughs> Or no, none of that, none of that. So, <laughs> I want to I want to go back to people doing stupid shit <laughs> with animals and it oh, puts them in stories? situations. No, no, no. I I have one for I've you. I've seen so many because I I've been in other countries around the world, and you some it's are third world ideas of how right. The, yeah, and they're you know when you get to third world areas, they still try to have a zoo for people or mm -hmm. something, and it is horrible. It's not anything that I would recommend. But I remember walking through this zoo in Southeast Asia, and it was the saddest zoo I'd ever seen. It looked like nobody had been there to even upkeep it in I don't know how long. But I was walking through and I had Cheetos and like a Sprite in my hand. And there was a monkey oh, no. in this cage. It was, everything's unkept. Like it hasn't, the things haven't been weed eated around, you know, this place is really defunct, you know, and <laughs> macaque is what it was. Oh no. So the macaque comes over to the cage. They look so cute. They look so unassuming. They look nothing, especially if they want their cute face and they're hungry. So this little shit, I'm feeling bad, <laughs> right, for this monkey, this little monkey, and he sticks his arm out the cage because I'm eating my Cheetos, and he's wiggling his opposable thumb, and he's getting human, he's very small, he looks like a child, I'm going to give him a Cheeto, and I do, give him a Cheeto, he brings it in, he just, he just eats it right up, and then he puts his hands out. But this time, he puts his hands out cupped. He's asking for Sprite. I'm like, shit, this guy's he's so cute. You know, he's luring me in a little shit again. So he sticks his hands out there, and I pour a little Sprite in his hands, and he holds it up, and he starts drinking it, you know. And then he sticks his hand out again. And, you know, I've got a Cheeto this time again, you know, because he only stuck out one hand. And his arm went from, like, six inches long to like fucking two and a half feet long. Yeah. <laughs> it came out of that cage and it, thank God I jumped as much as I did, but he got a hold of my pointer finger, right? And you know, they say like old women have like, uh, older women have like this crazy strength in their hands. Oh, yeah. That thing had the strength of like a hundred old ladies when it grabbed hold of my pointer finger and it started pulling my arm and I was like scream pulling it. I, I'm pretty sure I pulled his head into the cage from the other side because he wouldn't let go. It's okay. But when he was pulling, his mouth opened and all these fangs showed up. <laughs> And he was like hissing and pulling all at once. I will never fuck with a monkey again as long as I live. I was so <laughs> he was gonna eat my digit. Okay, he almost made defense, me only count to nine. He just wanted you to freak out and drop your stuff so he could eat it. You can pull it over and eat it. But still. Bro, I was giving you some man. Chill out. Nope, nope. nope. You were gonna like piecemeal and then walk away. He wanted the whole bag and the whole bottle. He wanted my finger. He wanted everything. He wasn't getting fed. So he was actually <laughs> just trying to get me to drop everything and run. Best case scenario, depending on the individual. He was trying to scare the Jesus out of you, so you drop your stuff. Or also, there's Cheeto dust on your finger. No, no. <laughs> there is a good chance of that. There's definitely Cheeto dust on my fingers, but, but it didn't lick, look though. like a Cheeto. But cacks don't lick, though. So no, you didn't have, uh, <laughs> of, the, of the mouth situation that I was staring at because you you don't forget when you see the oh. open mouth of a monkey with fangs looking at your finger and sizing it up. That's the only thing I remember. That is a permanent impression burnt upon and my mind. Remember the one eighty of the very versus the oh yeah he went the, he the went very, from very, uh, precious moments looking face with the big eyes like all those little statues that's evolution too dogs are the same thing. Yes, I, I tell people all the time. Dogs the are the eyes. smartest creatures on the planet. Nobody believes me when I say this, but here's the reality. They watched an entire species that was the most capable, capable of producing food, of doing all these things, but was insane because we are. Of all the animals, arguably, if all the animals are not doing what we're doing, which one's wrong? So they see us sure. standing and walking in circles, dropping shit and losing our minds, right? And what do they do? They walk over, 
they open their eyes up real big and they and they utilize their ability to provide serotonin and they lay there and give you fat face and they <laughs> and so you the cats, pet them cats have a and you drop meow for humans cats fucking don't like humans there's plenty of cats that like they have a special meow for humans yeah they have a special meow that's that just means that they know how to call for food. That's the same thing as that triangle, you know, or whatever else. They no, they're just there's plenty of dog cats. I no, have one. He needs his love. No, he owns you. Those things have like very sweet. They have the ability. No, I love cats too. Cats don't but like, but I recognize that they have an agenda, even in their pheromones, man. That's why there's cat ladies out there, or cat people, because they can control you. <laughs> It's a long. They spray everything so they can. It's a long con. It is. Oh, and here's the thing. Here's the other reason why I don't like cats. I am 100% sure that if I had a cat and I had Riley, the studio mascot, Bull Mastiff, if I died, like collapsed on my floor, I am 100% sure that the cat would be the first one to start eating my eyes and cheeks and lips and soft parts. It would wait. No, it wouldn't. Have, have you done that, that challenge with Riley where like you pretend to like fall out and see what happens? All she does is just sit against you because that's what she does. She just comes hey, over and sits against you. I'll just make sure no one hurts you while we wait for the ambulance that I'm assuming you already called. She knows I'm not upset. That's the thing. Like she's so in tune. They know know our emotions so well. The cat just knows when to avoid you. It's like, oh, he's loud. I'm gonna go over here. Yeah, no, I don't I don't see him in the food dispensary area or, you know, the scratching zone. There, you know, there's certain spots. They use you so horribly. They're not. They're lions in the house. There's there's plenty of there's plenty of lovely cats though. Uh, again, I like cats. Cats are indifference, you know, personified. <laughs> But you can play with them. They do have like personalities. There are just in general, dogs are more happy to see you like all the time and cats are more happy to see you maybe. So the barbershop is where you get all of the old off color jokes from like the from the, the elderly gentlemen <laughs> that hold on to them. Like, you know, I, I got a joke for you, you know, and this elderly gentleman told me a joke in the barbershop one time and he said, do you know the difference between your wife and a dog if you put them in a trunk? When you came back to see, or he said, which one will be happy when you come back to see him? Oh, yeah, the dog. Every time. Every time. I fucked that joke up real bad. But <laughs> of the two things, if you lock your wife and your dog in the trunk and you come back and open it, which one's going to be happy to see you? I mean, true. Every time. The dog's like, thanks for letting me out. The wife's like, run. The wife's going to kill you. Yes. I mean, obviously, it's a stupid joke. It's an old <laughs> off-color joke but from still, you. It makes but sense. Every time you open that trunk, the dog will be happy that you opened the trunk. It will be pissed that it was in there. It'll be happy that you opened it. The Wait, wife right. will be livid. Probably it's just like, I'm just here. Oh no, she's got she's got no gas tank. <laughs> she's the perfect dog to walk. She's got she's like a fullback in football. She's got like 10 yards and then she needs <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> hey academics. Have you endured life's tragedies, trials, and tribulations? Did you adapt and overcome? Do you have advice for others to pay forward and want to be a guest? Then email us a brief two to three minute video to show at thetragedyacademy.com and tell us how our academics can learn and grow from these experiences. Thanks again for your support. And now back to class. Compassion fatigue. I want to. I want to loop in here. We talked about like all these. No, but we talked back. about all these different animals and the impacts and and things like that. And we interact with animals just the same as we interact with each other. We just don't realize it. And in those moments, those animals are if they're if they want us there, right? Because we force ourselves. Let's face it. We force ourselves upon animals. And plus, with pets, they're they're your animal. They're domesticated. So as a zookeeper, you don't really have a lot of control over. It no, this isn't being, Dubai and you don't have, you know, 12. the animal is going to go somewhere else, even if it's for like a good reason and a good place. It's just like, oh, hey, in like two weeks, this animal is going to move to this other place. And you're like, oh, cool. OK. So no bond. Are you actually you do kind of. Yeah, that's that's where that compassion. There's, there's animals that move as part of uh, endangered breeding programs. 
there's animals that move as part of like, hey, we honestly don't really have the space and the ability to care. And this is a, is a good place. There's animals that move just because there's just different reasons. And you just have no ability to do anything about it. So you're just like up, down, up, oh. down, up, down. Or they bring them in already injured. They bring them in already, you know. And you try not to bond because you look at an animal and think, oh, you're not going to be here long. And you can't help it because you're not, you know, a sociopath. I think that we also have to help the mental health of the people that are in these roles. When you're in this situation, you're facing death over and over again. You're facing mortality over and over again. And you have to keep going because it's right. still like... Why does the death of the animal bother someone so bad if it's of natural or whatever it is? It's, you know, because there is no animal on this earth that's not going to die. I feel like we as a species have to stop making death such a horrifying thing. Right. We have to embrace it for the beautiful thing that it is decomposition, returning to earth, leaving and coming back and things like that. We wrap ourselves as so much of our society of everything that we do is to either prevent ourselves from thinking about death for a long, right? Uh, to distract us from it or we push ourselves place. away from any time that we see it in real life because it makes us question our own mortality every single time, even if it's a bird, even if it's a dog, even if it's a lion. Whenever you have to face it, the only thing that you're facing is the question as to what happened to them when their eyes closed. So instead of just embracing the fact that it's just as beautiful, we, we, make, it, we make it trauma. We've invented the trauma that comes from it. Because there's really no reason to be upset at it. It's like being upset at the sun for rising. You the fuck thing was coming. It does seem like a more modern problem. You go back in time to more ancient cultures, they all seem to have a way of working it in. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a cosmic fuck you to all of us to be conscious. To, to know you're going to die is a kick in the, the junk if you're a dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like that's 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 horrible. Like knowing like that you're right. gonna die is horrible. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. But if you accept it, then you don't invent all the things that come along with not wanting to see it or having to cope with it or coming up with other ways to deify it yourself can cause so in many the time that you're here. Arguments. I'm in the middle of one right now. I so I I volunteer for a uh, preservation cemetery. So occasionally they'll put out a call for like, hey, we have a a burial coming up. Who who's available for a dig? And so preservation cemetery. You mean for animals? Oh no. So uh, people. So there's there's conservation areas where you can be naturally buried. So this is shut a your mouth. We're talking about this after this. I want. <laughs> I, I keep going. It's a, so the place where um, it's Prairie Creek and uh, there's like a whole conservation area with like, you know, pathways and whatnot. You can like come and hike or ride your horse or what have you. And then part of it is cemetery allotment. So you can be naturally buried. Um, I believe the parameters are you either just go in bare or you have like a like a normal cloth of certain material like linen, like something that totally breaks down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or like like a mummy. If you have there, there's a marker like it's like a magnetic marker put on just for like keeping track of things in case someone wanted to come and visit you specifically. But then if you want any sort of headstone, it has to be natural. Like people will walk around. There's a family there once helping with the dig and they broke off to go find like driftwood and like make like a little makeshift. Uh, a That's headstone. super cool. It is. It's really cool. And being in conservation work, I, of course, am like trying to live more and more in an environmentally friendly way, you know, with like, you know, compost and what have you. And in a conversation with my mom about life insurance, which started the argument about insurance, I get car insurance, I get health insurance, I don't like paying for them, but I figure life insurance, for the most part, is supposed to give you time to level back out. Like say, like say, like we're married and we have two kids and like you're the breadwinner and you die. Your insurance is supposed to give me like the better part of a year to figure out how to make that money come back in the house. Right. But I don't really have that situation. Like I'm not going to have kids. My money pretty much takes care of me. The hubby's money pretty much takes care of him. So if one of us dies, it's more the oh, no, I miss them. Not so much a money issue. And I was like, oh, mom, we'll just like save your money. It's fine. Like life is going to be fine. It's cool. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, what about burying you? And I was like, well, it's not really going to cost anything. As soon as I felt it coming in my mouth, I was like, 
oh shit, that's right. We haven't really talked about this. And we're very different people, me and my mom. And I can hear the pause. Oh, you're a hippie. I can, so <laughs> I can hear the pause. And she's like, why would you do that to me? And I was like, uh, uh, ma. <laughs> it's, isn't it amazing that the responses do that to me? I was like, to be fair, technically, knock on wood, I'm going to outlive you so you'll never know. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> You'll look down on me and be like, that little heifer. And there'll be nothing you can do about it but possibly throw a lightning bolt at me. So it's fine. But then I'm, you're just then you're just hitting the bottom of the picnic barbecue because I'm already gone. Like you can you can torch it, but I'm already in the dirt. It's it's one of those, I think, generational difference issues you have where like you want your kids to be happy, but it seems to be in the way that you deem happy. Do you want them to be, be happy or do you not want them to capitalize on the understanding that they don't have to do all the things you did in order to be happy? Right. Like I would, I would look at her and how she overworked herself. And I thought that was the basis of my issues I was having with zookeeping when I was thinking of leaving. And then she would constantly be like, why are you, if I send like a Snapchat, like, oh, look at me. Like, why are you still at work? Oh my God, you've worked so much this week. I mean, I get money, but, you know, also you're getting older. You got to think of uh, something different to do. And then when I left, it was, well, why did you leave? There's a steady paycheck. I'm like, okay, which is it? Which is it? <laughs> well, first of all, they're told, you know, to save. I they're told it, yeah. to do all these things. They were and raised different, their, but also in a different time. With different, The world was different. They were told to put their dreams on hold, do the necessary things to get where you need to be to be able to pursue your dreams. And that is not, that's, that's actually the fallacy that is society. Yeah. They, you know, we feel like we're supposed to toy. We're not supposed to toil. That's an invented situation. I We're get working toward the goal, but then like if, if, if you put your dreams on hold to you're like you retire when you're 60, maybe you can't do your dreams then. What if your dream was like to like hike Mount Everest? I mean, there's just some fit 60 year olds out there. But I just feel like depending on whatever job made you wait so you were 60 to retire, probably didn't leave you physically intact or scaling Mount Everest when you're 60. So you're going to evolve throughout yeah. this time. And, and you get there are societal things. rungs that you'll come across that will dangle new carrots in front of you and you will continue to consume each and every one of them as you go up the ladder, trying to satiate the hunger that is the creativity and the original thing that you like had in you your know. heart to do to begin with. Mm -hmm. And the problem is you're going to reach a time in life where you're going to go, fuck, I didn't do that. And you're going to have a midlife crisis. You're going to fucking freak out. You're going to do something. Study abroad. You're One regret, I didn't do study abroad while I was in college. So go study abroad. I am. Like, I'm working please on tell me I'm what is in between you and abroad. Absolutely nothing. Exactly. If that's what you want to do, you just go do that. The rest of the shit will work out on the way. That's pretty much what I'm doing now, winging life. I thought it was winging life before, but I think I was just winging planning things before. Now I'm truly winging it. It's pretty nice. Well, it's it's called living in the now. And I get it. I get I, I get the fear, but I also get that that's because again of the upbringing and the and the life experience and how and money is a stable the, There's jealousy in there. Whenever we envy somebody else's situation or their ability to do something that we couldn't we will try to hold them back. And that is not discriminate between generations. Correct. Or, you know, it's not just peers. Generations will do that. Well, I mean, let's look at look at the LGBTQ, um, et cetera, because um, I'm going to screw that up. I, like, <laughs> I don't know the other ones, so no disrespect. But I feel like the repression against that entire grouping of people, which we've seen a lot of it's generational, mm -hmm. um, is the group of people that, had all of the feelings and all of the desires and all of the things that those people have today, yet they were not given the chance yes. to be themselves. So now on their way out the door to justify to themselves, they're going to say it's heresy or whatever it might yeah. be because they don't want to admit that they really wanted to, you know, be their their normal intended yeah. self at the time. And I get sometimes it's timing and it's like the whole like, why isn't your the, the whole, oh, I went through it. You'll go through it too. It's like, no, wouldn't you want it to get better? That's something I heard Vince Harry say his dad said to him. I, was like, I get it. 
some of it's timing and some of it is being jealous of the person. They're different people. Sometimes people will tell me a story and I'm like, why didn't you slap her? And it's like, oh, I would never. It's like, I would have slapped her so hard in front of a cop. Uh, yeah, of course you but, would, because you had a different set of experiences coming up to that day than the person, than the other person deciding not to, to. And so the whole thing is someone had to start it somewhere. So why not be happy that someone took that huge risk? Because some of these risks do put you in danger. There's some people don't take risks because they are literally in danger. There's people I've talked to where I've been like, talk to me anytime. But like, also, like, let's work on some code words. Like, so we can talk about the change to the topic. If someone walks in the room, if you can't be yourself, like you literally can't because of where you are, your family or whatever. I get that. So that's an endangered situation. Yeah. What about not knowing that you are in danger to yourself in that you are actually putting up self-defense mechanisms to your own insecurities in life and they come out as personality and character traits and flaws and things like that within you? And that's why the whole like mental health discussion should be more public and should be like more in school. It's like, hey, if you're feeling this, you know, it's actually not weird. A lot of people do that. Here's some possible causes. Look at your life. See if you can figure it out. Um, feel free. How about to it's to okay to feel that? It's, it's just, just, just. It's okay to feel that right now. I think that's why TikTok has gotten so big. Because even though there's some random crazy on there, there's also so many people of. Oh my god, that's. I agree. Oh, is that what that is? I'm 35, and only within this week did I figure out something pertaining to my own female health. In part because of TikTok. And I was sort of real pissed because I was like, you know what? In hindsight, I really should have been able to figure this out on my own. Like I have a computer and whatnot. I just never followed up on it. And there when I so finally did, there learned. was someone who was like, oh, yeah, someone made a TikTok about it. And I'm like, really? I looked it up and I was like, oh, look at that. So I mean, that's funny. We had a um, we had a guest, Karen Laven. She authored a book a long, long time ago. Because we're talking about starting out doing something that you want to do to, you know, from the heart, mm -hmm. but then putting it on the back burner. And it was, it's, I actually have the book up there because it was the first one that was sent to me. Um, it's the other 23 days, alternative uses for feminine hygiene products. Oh my God. I know. So no, it's funny stuff. It's like you, you can use a, like a you can put a maxi pad across the top of your glasses as a visor. If you don't have a hat. Um, She's <laughs> You can use the big ones as Swiffers Oh, because <laughs> they have the adhesive side. There's like all sorts of shit in there. But here's the reality. She's got a point. Of she talked that. about, dude, there's so many that I was like, this is genius. Um, she's got so many of them, but she talked about the fact that she had had struggled when she had gone through, you know, her first period and all these types of things. She went through a lot of pain. She went through like, you know, different shame scenarios and all this kind of stuff. And I don't even think she knew, but she did know at the same time that she was writing this book to normalize conversation around that so that it wasn't so taboo because she was getting thrown out of bookstores. You know, they're like, you can't do that. And they're like, that's so stupid, but it's a generational thing. Yeah. And you know what? I think that's a jealousy thing at that point, because if you're still hiding the discussions of that. That just means you're upset because you didn't get a chance to talk about it when you were younger. Which I get being upset, but it just makes no sense. And you you purposely want someone else to go through the same pain you went through. Of course, misery loves company. That's that still makes no sense, man. It's a void. It's a it's a you're constant supposed to make suck. Make things better. You're supposed to leave it better than you found it. Or leave no trace. You're supposed to. You're supposed to. And, uh, you know, what we hope is that at some point throughout your development, you come to a screeching halt and you go, okay, I actually do get it. I'm, you know, the name of the game is not X, hard. Y, or Z. True. It can be hard to have a moment of, oh, yeah, no, I fucked up. That was, that's, that's wrong. I should. I've I done should so stop. many fucked up things in my life. So many fucked up things, things that I'll be ashamed of for the rest of my life, you know, and I've done great things in my life. You know, but all of them made me who I am. You know, you have to embrace each and every single thing that you go through and stop making things Gross. catastrophes. When you, when you talked about being canceled, that's the problem with cancel culture. You don't allow people to like learn. You just shut them down. There, you, don't, you don't look at any nuance in what they said and how there could be a conversation around it. You don't look at how the person grew because sometimes you get canceled for things that happened a while ago. 
And I'm like, everyone's like, it seems so shocking. I'm like, maybe it is shocking because that person has changed. Did you think of that? that? How shitty would it be if someone didn't forgive you or allow you to change, even though you know you did? Yeah. Deep down, you know you did, but you were not given the opportunity. That sucks. Labels suck and they're there just as a way it's all it is, is a tick mark for you to be able to look at someone and be in a better moral or high ground. High ground. It's yeah. just a high ground move under any circumstances. Those labels, the reason why they stick them on us is because they are an ability to rank yourself with the person next to you or know where you exist next to them because our currency, our bio bio survivability tickets, our money and things like that are all constructed off of social cues. They are. Like, it's all manipulation. You go into an interview, you're not being yourself. When you answer the Ah. customer service, you know, person on the phone, you're not being yourself. You're being yourself when you answer it for your buddy Joe or whatever. You know, you're like, fuck's up, asshole. You know? All the memes. So, why should we hire you? Because you're hiring. Yeah, it's so... Because... Why do you want this job? Because I need money. Those are masks. Those are all masks, and we put on a different mask for every interaction that we have. People, Bob, keeping it real, that's the stupidest definition I've ever heard, because that is not what I'm talking about. It's actually knowing what your cause and effect, cause and effect. Once you know cause and effect, you're in big shit, because everything that you put out will come back, and it will continue to ripple. Once you have that knowledge... But you get to realize the more good you put forward, the more you receive back. It just happens that way. People, have you ever noticed that the person with stink face? We all know what stink face is. I mean, that's a universal term. Stink face. You know, that people that have resting bitch face. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Stink face, right? Why do they keep stink face? Have we ever wondered that? No, stink face is like a level up. Why do they have stink face? Because something bothers them. Something happened originally, right? Something triggered stink face. But stink face is just bringing them more causes of stink face. That's all it is. They're asking for stink face people or stink face situations. That's why facial expressions change. They change. But if you've stuck yourself in fucking Stinkville, guess what? You're going to, and every person that comes across that stink face leaves with what? Stink face. Every fucking time. I'm thinking about the cashier. Face. You know, the dude standing there that's got that fucking face. Oh, uh, yeah. With those moments where you're just like, hey, I know it's not the most glamorous job, but could you not look like so? Don't throw ball? your shit on me. Yeah. Like, just because it took me two pulls out of the wallet for the right debit card does not mean you need to start casting shade on me or whatever the fuck it is you're doing there. Uh, <laughs> like, fucking rolling your eyeballs. Your eyeballs hit the floor. They rolled so hard. It's a debit card slick. Oh, man. You know, but, and that's the thing. What happened? I got aggravated and it's, I took that it just, away. It just rolls on. It's like it that does. one. It's like the IHOP chick I'll never forget. It just rolls on. The IHOP chick? So, my um, friends and I went to IHOP. And so I've been a waitress. So I'm always like, okay, if a place is like busy or something, I'll be like, hey, can I get a water whenever you can? Whenever you can. It's, it's, I can see that you're busy. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that. She just sucked as a waitress and a human being. So we order our food and there was some special going on where you get, if you order a certain thing, you also get like unlimited pancakes. And I was like, oh, well, obviously I will get that. This is before I went on like my more health journey. So I was like, fuck yeah, unlimited pancakes. Let's do this. And so most of us at the table got something that came with unlimited pancakes. Well, she had put down this, that, and the other, and I put down uh, part of my my thing. Other people who had the order and unlimited pancakes got like the first thing of pancakes. And so I was like, oh, maybe it's because she can't carry it all. I mean, she only has two arms, but there was space. And so I was like, oh no, this friend ordered something similar and didn't get unlimited pancakes. And I was like, oh, oh no. Oh, hey, um, I might have not communicated well, because I don't. I might have not communicated well. He wanted the insert whatever, and I wanted the insert whatever, a slightly different word, with the unlimited pancakes. 
when she, no lie, in this exact voice said, yeah, okay, I'm sure I didn't get it wrong. Okay, like, just wait. And walks off. And I was like, okay, I'm sure she's a little stressed. And I was like, what was that? I'm like, you know what? It's fine. I'm so happy. I haven't seen one of these friends in a while. And one friend's new to like the group. So I'm like introducing friends. I'm like, "Eh, it's fine. It's fine. She returns with the rest of everyone else's food and not my pancakes, which is the fucking point of going to the international house of pancakes, to which I waited watching and was like, so my pancakes. Oh my God, really? Okay, I'll get your pancakes. And I was and she, like with the whole throwing her. I don't down. want those pancakes. Please don't bring me those pancakes. <laughs> this whole this whole interaction is over. No. If you bring me those pancakes, I'm gonna spike them on the floor because I know <laughs> that they have got like they've they've been given so many stirs of other oh, shit. No, I watched. I watched because I, I, at the time he was like you might want to not eat. He said, you might want to not eat those. Everyone was like reacting to her like, oh my God. And I was just like, hold on. I can't talk. I have to watch. Oh good. She's bringing out pancakes. Because they're just putting out the little mini sacks of pancakes as fast as they can for everyone. So they're already mm-hmm. done. So uh-uh. she has to take it and Yours, walk right through. Those weren't chocolate chips in your pancakes. <laughs> so I, for one thing, ordered way too many unlimited pancakes. Like I was stuffed myself. So I was like, no, I'm going to make you walk back and forth because fuck you. And then I did something that I swore I would never do. Have you ever heard of the penny tip? No, it's the penny tip. The penny tip is a major middle finger. You literally tip a penny. You make them go through the effort of taking a penny off your card or just leaving a penny, a physical penny. Just like a, I took this out. I dug this out to put on the table because you suck. And I remember thinking I would never do it. I penny tipped that bitch. I penny tipped her. He penny tipped her. He penny tipped her. She penny tipped her. But one of our friends was really afraid and was like, guys, you can't do that. And I was like, why the fuck not? That is literally the bitchiest bitch. And I've had waitresses who had a right to be bitchy, who weren't bitchy. And she is just a cunt. And she's getting pan. I never thought I'd do it, but I'm penny tipping that cut. Well, I mean, and he tipped her like the amount that he paid for his fucking food. And I didn't forgive him for like a full month. I would bring it up at every opportunity. Oh, he, I was like, why are you shamed you, you all with a fat why tip? Why did you pay her? Everyone else penny tipped. Why you undid our penny tip? God damn it. <laughs> oh, he martyred himself right there. I'd have been so pissed. I was. Uh, I was. We were all just well, trying to talk him out of it. We were like, no, dude. I, you know, the I am not, I don't condone that either. Tip. And he was like, well, I mean, she does. Well, then why? Why? Penny tipping is worse than not tipping. That's the whole point. And he's like, but like, what if we come back? Well, if we see her, we won't use her as our waitress. Like, what the hell? Yeah, see, I can't. I I agree with you. That is not something you do to servers, right? As That's in general, how angry always I was. Well. That's but how angry I was. If you're the server who always gets shitty tips, you might want to go look reflect, in the mirror, reflect, because I will avoid places. Something I picked up from the hubby. I will avoid places if I'm down on money that that usually you tip at. Because I'm like, you know what? Instead of just giving a small tip, I could just not go because I'm low on money. So I'll Free that chair up for somebody so with I'll, a disposable income. Yeah, I'll save money eating food I have at home. You know how you, you have food, but you're just like, oh, fuck it. So I just won't go. So if I go to a place like IHOP where you tip, I was fully prepared to tip you, but you were a bitch. <laughs> I've never before or since. Yeah, if they're aggressive, anyone. if you're aggressive, I'm not going to yeah, give you my money. Yeah, it wasn't like passive, like, I'll give you bare minimum to be nice tip. It was in your face. I got to take my shoe off and launch it at you aggressive. And I was like, nope. I could hear the little whisper in my mind. Any tip. And I was like, oh, no. You know what? Actually, fuck her. Oh, well. <laughs> never before or since, I swear. Have so I so, so let me let me let me spin this. All right. What if her mom died and she came in because she had to work and her <sighs> boss made her get there, screamed in her and said, you're going to lose your job if you're not here. She came in and you said, where's my pancakes? And she misunderstood you and was just at the end of her rope and got upset. And then she went back to that table, still upset at whatever was going on in her world to see three pennies and then a fat tip. Well, then I... Forgive my friend for fat tipping. The the thing is, is we I don't know bad. at any given moment what somebody else is going through. Maybe the guy He's that is sometimes tailgating you on the highway at like Mach 1 and going back and forth. Is trying to get to his wife who's in labor. Or his mom or his brother is in the hospital. 
You know, you forget, man. we don't know what's yeah, going on behind anybody's eyes. We have no idea what somebody else's set of experiences that brought them there. It's why they say don't judge people. You can't judge because there's no way. Or at least try to try to rationalize, like try to look at it afterwards. No, just, just don't judge it. Accept that it's happening. It's going to be hard. Be- it's, it's an innate thing to judge. It's like a survival thing. It's like a person with tattoos. Late at night. Oh no, might be a gangster. And it's like, no, I just really like tattoos. I can hear you. Hi, I'm a tattoo artist. Oh, hi. Sorry. No, it's okay. I get all the time. So you're you're hitting on something stereotyping, right? Cognitive bias, things like that, and that's a real thing. That ex- oh my god, it's gonna kill me. I'm like with kisses. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, there's it, it happens with people all the time. It happens with you know, in clothing and you know, dialects of speech or, you know, they assume that somebody with a Southern accent wouldn't be, you know, scientifically minded or, you know, an Asian person, Southern accent, an Asian person with a Southern accent is weird to people. And it's like, no, they're American, you dumbass. They're not supposed to have the accent of the place that their great, great, great grandma came from. I've had a handful of people tell me that I speak so well being from Texas. You speak so well. I was like, what a, what a fucked up thing to differentiate yeah, yourself between you and someone like, else. Okay. What, what, how am I, how am I supposed to take that? It's a yeah, I don't even understand that. Is it though? It's a back end. Is company. it? <laughs> Even though you're from the land of trash, you came out pretty articulate. And the thing is, in some of those instances, we were in like conventions and stuff. And I'm like, okay, so let's set aside the fact that maybe, let's say, isn't it like Mississippi is like the last in education or whatever? That insert so many people getting mad right now. Let's say that you, on your transcript, are from a school that has failed every benchmark. You're from a city in a state that consistently cranks out high school dropouts or something. Let's say... I think it's them in Arkansas, by the way. Let's say that on paper, your background says, when I open my mouth, you're probably going to like smack your hand to your forehead. But I'm at a convention on neuroscience and I have a badge that says like, I'm a guest speaker. Don't, Shouldn't that make you pause? Don't black people just deal with this as, yeah. as existence? And you know what? That's not something I really realized when I was an adult. I really thought that it was more of a, well, you know, different, different people have different backgrounds. And, you know, look at me. I have persevered and been just fine. And I will look back at certain instances and be like, oh, you're being racist. I just was so oblivious. I didn't pick up on it. Oh, They nice. don't even know. <laughs> People don't know that their cognitive biases will give them, uh, it will put them in situations where they're unintentionally being racist yeah. um, all the time. And then I see my black friends in the black community, black folks, you know, that have to do things that are out of their normal character, not as a race, but as a person mm-hmm. in order to get through or navigate a situation business, social, whatever it is, so that they could be accepted and mm-hmm. black, you know, and, and, and that's, that's fucking ridiculous. And I used to think it was just like a business world thing. And then I got older. Oh no, it's like, real. Oh no. Okay. This is, this is weird. And you get it's it from both ends. You get it from both ends. I was called an Oreo, like my entire childhood, which I thought was a compliment because I was very sheltered and I love Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I was like, oh yes, I'm delicious with milk. Thank you. Like, what? What do you? Why are you calling me that? It wasn't until like an Asian fan was like, like that. That moved the town was like, I'm pretty sure they're making fun of you. Yeah, it's like uh, with my wife when is Colombian them, they and they call them eggs. Eggs. Yeah, you're uh, white on the outside, white on the outside, yellow on the inside. Yeah, they. You, somebody said <laughs> maybe me. I call my wife a coconut because she's yeah, yeah, Colombian. Yeah. She's brown on the outside, white yeah. in the middle because she can't speak a lick of Spanish or anything like that. Yeah, and they get mad like, how come you know Spanish? It's like because she wasn't raised. Yeah, I know. I'm just teasing but her. For but people, you, you you get it from like both ends because they don't like, have where to. Do I, where do I like? Wait, how am I supposed to fit? Like, what what is this? What is this? What's going on? Why do I have to fit? There's that too. Well, like that's that's my question. I asked. That was a question. I had. I mean, we were kids, so we I I was sort of on it, and I asked the kid. It was like, why do you talk like that? I was like, like what? Like that? I'm like, like what? Like, like you always talk all proper. I'm like, well, that's English. And then you stood there, and I stood there, and I was like, I feel like that wasn't the question you were asking, but that's what you said. So that I'm gonna communication is one of the biggest dividers out there. Language is one of the biggest dividers out there. People don't understand cultural differences because of languages. There's words that don't exist for other words and other languages, you know, or feelings or things like that. They just don't exist because we haven't identified the existence of it. 
so many different ways to communicate these days, you know, uh, like text and things like that. I'm a huge fan of emoticons mm -hmm. because you cannot read somebody's emotion through straight text and you shouldn't treat somebody else like shit for needing emoticons. And the reason why they might need them is because they had a shitty communication system for X amount of time. So they have a problem with feeling like people are judging them in these situations. So it's easier for them to end a conversation knowing that it was on a happy note, but whatever it might be, it's kind of like wearing a fucking mask. Why the fuck won't I wear a mask? I just, even if I don't believe in it or I do believe in it, where the fuck it is, if it makes the person next to me feel better and they're not having a panic attack, fucking throw it on. Not a big deal. It's not the end of the world, but it's a far better than them fucking freaking out and then me getting mad and then going back and forth. Treat it like a rubber, dude. Just put it on <laughs> and just, you know, protect yourself. Who the fuck cares? <laughs> I don't understand this. This PSA brought to you by Trash Day Academy. Yeah, treat your mask like a rubber. Just put it on. You know, you're, that's the way I look at it. Just stick it on, walk around with it. I'm not going to catch anything. You know, that's isn't that what it's about? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm still on. <laughs> <laughs> did I just trivialize a pandemic ah! and mask wearing? Yes, I did. Ah! I'm going to get hate mail. I'm going to get, you can't, it's not a condom. It's not. Oh, no, but I just watched this video by Abraham Preach. And I think it, even though it goes a bit more on the medical history side, I think it really sums up what I was trying to say in that, if people hear that you don't want to get the vaccine. So I got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because I did a bunch of research and that's the one I, I decided to get, which I only got. I think I would have eventually ended up getting it. I got it because I was going to Texas to see family. I had an uncle that I thought might pass away who did, but it, I didn't get there in time. And I wouldn't have been allowed in any way because of hospital stuff I found out. But also my mom was like, well, I'm not letting you in to her apartment if you don't have a vaccine, which was part of the whole issue of why I was hesitating to get it because it seems like it's so, it's such a, what's wrong with you instead of a discussion about it. Usually there's a, like, yes, there's a pandemic. You don't like being on. forced to do something. Yeah, like, oh my gosh, shun your friends and family for not getting it because they're anti-vaxxers. No, anti-vaxxers are very different. The so, anti-vax argument is different. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I was anti this particular one because I just wanted more information instead of just being thrown well, yeah it was a fast face. rollout we should all yeah. you, you and should I be get aware that. And I get that they were rolling it out fast because there's a pandemic. However, comma, I still, I, I I didn't have any reason to get it right then before I decided to go home or like to Texas. So I was just like, can I get some more information? Can I see some more stats? Can I see like some more things? That's all. I was just putting it well, off so much. The I vaccination just, for me was uh, basically me being able to not get sick without a rubber. <laughs> Anything is seriously oh like uh, I'm so I'm a bit confused. I don't talk about political and societal crap, but in this particular case, I'm 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 curious why people. So if I get the vaccine, mm -hmm. right? Why do I care who the fuck else is vaccinated? I get the argument. The part of the argument is, you know, like 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 the flu. There's variants, and so you need to get it again or get a different kind or something like that. I, I'm not even saying that. I, I'm saying like I'm vaccinated. So the fuck do I care about where I go or what I do at that point? Isn't that the point of the vaccination? In my opinion, yes. So again, I, I'm I'm still confused sometimes as to why a lot of this you know turmoil exists. It does seem I understand to be there's like children and people can have it if they don't turmoil. have it. But at the end of the day, like I, I don't know, man. I just keep my shot group tight. I try to stay in my own home and you know not bother people. And I if get it's, it. Yeah, I'm not trying I'm not to going like, to a concert, go or, out and do like horrible, you know, mass gathering events. I know. Like actually, a, a I go to the local so. orphanage and I cough on all the children. The repeat. <laughs> 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 And then I go over to the nursing homes and I do the same thing where I cough all over them just too. So they don't have to suffer yeah. anymore? Well, before I get there, I put my tongue on an escalator rail just to make sure I've got all the stuff. Okay. <laughs> just, you're, you're really an angel of mercy. I am. I see. I see it. <laughs> I'm killing orphans it does, and old people. It with. just does seem like a bit of manufactured <laughs> turmoil. My God. Why why orphans? You what turmoil go, is not you didn't manufactured? You want to go through like a jail or anything? You went for the orphanage and the nursing home. <sighs> <laughs>
Nobody wanted him. I'm I'm joking. God, no. I'm like, I, I'm, this is a PSA for Oliver Twist. I'm sorry, man. I got I you, brother. So many people were writing angry emails and they had to restart the email so many times. <laughs> no, it's bullet points. <laughs> Dude, no, oh, I would never. It's just all about being kind to those around you. That's that's the bottom line and having empathy. You know, com- I thought about fostering, but I'm good. No, because if they took them away, I'd fucking lose my shit. I couldn't, I couldn't do like do back and forth and that kind of thing. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Now I was just thinking about how when I was younger, before I realized that like child fee by choice was a thing, I was like, oh man, I wonder, uh, it's gonna, and then it was like, oh, oh wait, I don't have to. Oh, cool. I guess I could like foster, but I, I, I could adopt is what was the next step. I was like, well, I can adopt because like part of me not wanting to do it is physical. Oh, hey, well, what if, what if I foster? So I'm helping, right? And I'm not even having to make any more. And I was just like, or I could. Do just you need up. some more of that uh, compassion or that, uh, what was it? Uh, caretaker. What is the word? Compassionate. Uh, is there a caretaker? Fatigue. It's probably like caretaker fatigue. Yeah, well, it's the same thing, I would assume. Probably. But, but it's like very specific. Are you like, looking for more of those issues? No, it was just my process, my mental process when I was younger, working into like... Did you know that you would you would keep tabs on every single one of these fostered kids and you would be dropping off later, bubble teas all over the freaking... Ten years later, I'm just like at like their wife's work, like, hi. Do you remember me? Hey, Tony, you don't know me, but tell Tony... I found this when I was cleaning. It's his old binky. So I thought he might want to put that like in a shadow box or something. Um, Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. It looks like you got you got over that, that flu real nice. We're like, what? Yeah. Like, I haven't seen you since I was eight and I was only there for three weeks. I know. It was magical. It was I, magical. I think, I think we were- <laughs> All right. Now we're describing a different, a different mental disorder. Before we go far down that, that path. I, I want to thank you for coming in. And there was one last thing that you wanted to get to. You brought in a couple of pictures of something. Yeah. And I just want to knock this out real quick because I don't understand this unhealthy obsession that you have with okay, this everyone, creature. Everyone, people, people, listen to me. I'm I'm being bigoted. I'm being anti have, all these things. I have two favorite animals. Okay. My first is bears. Bears are cute. Bears are awesome. Yes, they can... They can feasibly, you know, kill you. But that's sort of kind of your fault. Why were you there? However, comma, right behind that is bats. Ugh. And I used to work at Luby Bat Conservancy. So I brought this. Because this is actually like like like, like a re... For those of you out there, uh, she re- asked my wife... Re, 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 filming, re, what do you call this? Recording. 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 It's a re-recording. There yes. we go. Yes. There we go. And so the every time when we were ending, I was trying to get him to say that bats are all right. You don't have to like them, but you can respect their place in the ecosystem. So I was like, look, I'll bring cute things to show him. I'll bring this painting I made. Don't 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 be trying oh, to favorite, use your media boy. influence on Look me. At him. It's 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 a painting of a photo and there's also a, a picture of me holding See, the photo okay, so of here's the thing. beneath him. That was my business card. No problem with bats. I, I think bats are great. I have a particular problem with a particular bat. But why? No. In Panama, Here. they have this fucking bat. Uh, you know, there is a such thing as a vampire bat. Yes, there's three. Yeah. Well, there's three real vampire bats. There's the, like, like the false vampire bat. There's three blood bats. Correct. I don't know how many there are, but I know this little son of a bitch is one of them. And they live in Panama and they were giving us like these Common fucking classes. Bat. And they started describing how this little shit operates. <laughs> and that was it for me. People don't know. The, yeah, sure. This bat flies, right? Just like every other bat, blind, you know, sonar, squeak, squeak, whatever it's doing out there. And then oh, that. what it does is it fucking hits, it hits the ground or near you and it turns into Rambo and it starts low crawling <laughs> up its fucking victim like, <laughs> like, like a sniper in the fucking fields. Oh, duh. No, I'm finishing this because that thing is <laughs> thing is violent. It crawls up you ever so lightly while you're asleep. Then to add insult to injury, that fucker's tongue has a numbing. It. It's got ambisol in it or like Orogel or some shit or whatever it is. Licks your neck, numbs it. So now you don't even know he's there. And it lets him puncture you like a high C and sit there and just drink up while you're sleeping. That is not cool. Okay, a couple of things. The common vampire bat 
has retained the ability to run. So that's why it goes to the ground. At one point in time, so bats evolved to fly. And it Are kept you up trying to win me over with that statement? It's just, it's not like That's dive like bombing. watching that girl it's in not The bombing. Exorcist go backwards down the stairs in a crab walk. I don't want to see a bat running. That sounds creepy as shit. It's adorable. Look up vampire bat running. They have little treadmills and they like watch how fast it can run. It's awesome. It's not dive bombing. It just has the ability to. No, I'm not even talking about dive bombing. I'm thinking about that lizard or that has like the flaps running at you. I picture the bat running at you with his wigs out. In the Jurassic Park <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, that one actually was pretty gnarly. I was more afraid of that one than like the T-Rex because it was just it was like, you know, like the bright colors to distract you so you don't, you pause and then it gets you. That was smart. That was smart. But here's the thing. Here's Running the thing. bats. Here's the thing. You're Yes, if you're in Panama, then yes. It's like going to a particular country and having a higher risk of catching something. But you, as a whole, have a far greater risk of catching rabies from, like, a neighborhood dog that someone didn't get shots for. I'm not worried about freaking rabies. And, I'm worried about and, that leathery-looking little shit fanging up my neck. Do you know what's in their saliva? It's a substance called Draculin, because that's fucking funny. And they use it in heart medications for stroke patients. Uh-uh. It no, this like. thing is not like Crestor or some shit Crestor? like that. What? <laughs> <Some> heart medication. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if that's what that's for. I just named the first commercial that I heard most recently. Seroquel or something. <laughs> Whatever the fuck. They're... Imagine they had an animated bat selling it. So as you can see, <laughs> they're describing the little physiology of how it works. I feel like that would be a better character you, for a diabetes needle. Actually, for insulin. That, that's <laughs> actually not a bad idea. Have an animal somehow related to it describing how it works. That'd be awesome. But no, but yeah, like it's not you, you, you hardly part of why you don't feel it is because their, their teeth are so small. It's like less a bite and more of a, like a, like a, uh, like a, nope, like a nope, 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 rodents and first of all you're probably thinking of insectivorous ones and none of the freak of voice look like oh fruit bat you mean like those things or even though they're also bats they look even less like rodents they look more like puppies but i call them sky puppies everyone calls them sky puppies so those are those big sons of bitches that you have right like like this he is he's one of them he's a big malayan flying fox she's a variable flying fox See that that's fine. It's that one with the fangs crawling up to to eat you. That's not a problem. That it's thing just, looks like a fox with like the. It looks like a chicken wing that had all the stuff pulled out of it and got burnt the, on the back corner no. of the grill. Do you know vampire bats help feed one another? If there's one that's like weak or sick and can't go out, it'll it'll save extra blood so it can go back to the roost and feed. Don't it. most animals feed each other? No. That's not like a common, common thing. Oh, okay. They, they might like, you know, help get you there, but they don't like gather food, extra food, not eat it on the way back and let you and have it. it. It's a few, it's a few cycles from being Darwinian they'll, enough to They'll work with petted. you to share food. Like the, the monkey experiments where they have to, uh, there's treats on one side, but the monkey over there can't get to it. You have to work with the second monkey who helps open it and sort of goes off the whole, you're going to give me some, right? Premise. And they do because they're nice. Oh, the sharing. It's a bad share. Capuchins for the win. Yeah, but they also They're bite. still insane. Capuchins are insane. Capuchins? Think of Friends. The oh, the that head. thing. Do you know what was funny? When they played the uh, the Friends um, reunion, mm -hmm. they asked him what he hated the most about being on Friends, and he said it was the fucking monkey. <laughs> it's because they are not a piece meant of shit. to be, they are not meant to, everyone's like, oh my God, well, I like a monkey like Ross. No, the fuck you don't. No, I can't think of anything worse. You haven't had to take care of those things. They are insane. Uh, they are, they only get the cute moments on camera. Every time I see a capuchin in the, in the, in the, TV show or anything, I'm like, that's like five minutes of film that took a week of preparing and like two days of like, is he in a good mood? Is he in a good mood? Shoot now, shoot now. Come, come, come do your lines. And just, uh. No, thank And then, of course, because of that, someone thinks, yeah, I'll have a capuchin for a pet. I'm sure it won't hit puberty and turn on me. That was the one good thing friends did. They were like, oh, hey, by the way, if you get this as a pet, it's not a good idea because this happens. But then, yeah, they kind of highlighted that. And, and it got all it went to like turned into an asshole. And I was like, that's still not good. Fine, fine. At least you highlight the problem with most exotic pets. Like the Dubai Zoo is like mostly all former pets. 
didn't they offer him zoo bucks because they yes. got his, his monkey was stolen? They yes. tried to give him fifty dollars yes. or fifty zoo bucks or some shit. Yes, and like unlimited <laughs> pasta, some crap. Like, oh, We'd like my... to offer you some zoo bucks for I losing your monkey. Friends, that's exactly where I stopped. Where the janitor was like meeting him to tell him like what really happened. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I think we'll be here all day if I don't wrap this up. <laughs> I was like, I'll talk more about animals. I, I genuinely appreciate you coming in. And I think that uh, compassion fatigue is something that people should um, really pay attention to. But we should also pay attention to the fact that it happens to everybody in so many different junctures. And I think what it just all boils down to is being empathetic to one another. Even if you haven't had the experience, suspend judgment and understanding, you know, until you have the opportunity to clearly, you know, look into what it is that they're feeling. Just be compassionate up front and learn the empathy on the way. That and if we're doing closing notes, please don't go on Sue Keeper's social media and shit on them because of like a 20 second thing you saw about their zoo or a zoo in general. Please don't go and take a little snippet of something you saw and make a whole video about it and spread it without knowing the full knowledge and bringing a lot of hate down on that place. Where you Just don't stop what's spreading going on. anything angry. Oh, e even when it's not angry, they're like, look, we want them to do better. And it's like, that actually is... Oh, that's the tortured yeah, dog it's things. Really, I don't like seeing it's, those. It's things like, uh, they'll see like, look, they're in small cages. They're in transport cages. They have to be small. For, it actually makes them feel better. And also, you just can't transport the entire enclosure, like, all at once. You, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, moving habitats. Or, now. like, look, they're putting their hands in there. That's how that works. Did, did you ask the person at all? No, you just filmed. So you didn't even ask the person who could have told you. Most people find these films and then reconstruct what they... Oh, no. There's, what, there's one guy I saw. He went to, like, SeaWorld or somewhere and just, like, infiltrated, which is just him, like, filming the whole time, like, with his camera, like, barely out. And I'm like, everything you pointed out, if you just asked the person standing right there, they would have told you. Yeah. People, they're just looking for, you think, for Riley? anything. Yeah, Riley's in studio today. <laughs> She's like, what? That I, I didn't mean All to All right. Me. So thank you so much, D. I really appreciate you coming. Um, for those of you out there, you can find her on TikTok at what's your... Uh, What's your TikTok I'm, is your name? Is it the D McBee or just D McBee? I want to say the it's the D, D McBee. The D McBee. Which is the same for Insta. Yeah, and we'll uh we'll have that in the notes. You can see all the cool animals that she's had on there and all the stuff that she's been up to lately. Bays are awesome. Bats are Thanks cool. so much, everybody, Bats for uh for downloading today. And remember, be cool and keep learning. Yes. Stay in school your whole life. Hey academics, thanks again for attending another class at the Tragedy Academy. You can show us some love by subscribing, downloading, and rating us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Or ask Amazon Alexa to play the Tragedy Academy podcast. You can find links to all major podcast platforms and past episodes at thetragedyacademy.com. You can find us on all the majors of social media on Instagram at the Tragedy Academy 2019, on TikTok at The Tragedy Academy, and on Twitter at Tragedy underscore Academy, where we'll post our clips of upcoming shows, updated info, and thoughts. If you'd like to be a guest, send an email to show at thetragedyacademy.com. Keep an eye out on Instagram for Tragedy Academy giveaways. Thanks again for coming to class, and remember, be cool, keep learning. What's up, academics? This is Jay. I'm here to talk to you about Into the AM. This is a clothing and apparel company that I came across last year that has the absolute coolest designs. And the reason why I was attracted to it is because I grew up without a lot of money, like many others, and had to shop on that outlet rack with the irregular items. Things like the fly was over four inches to the left, or the right sleeve would be twice the size of the left. It looked like I was growing horizontally. Like, it's okay, honey, you'll grow into your left arm. So you really don't get a chance to express yourself the way that you want to. You go into life, you start putting on suits, you start putting on uniforms, and you realize you'd never had a chance to truly express yourself. Enter into the AM, a team of artists and creators who share a common vision. They see clothing as a canvas to express what drives you. Since 2012, They've developed premium apparel that elevates self-expression and provides unparalleled comfort for wherever your passions take you. Into the AM's passion for change is the driving force behind their brand. They remain committed to creating products that inspire and promote self-expression by partnering with like-minded organizations focused on giving back to communities in need. Last year, they donated 1% of all revenue from their graphic tees collection to the Art of Elysium charity. 
The Art of Elysium is an artist organization built on the idea that through service, art becomes a catalyst for social change. For over 24 years, the Art of Elysium has paired volunteer artists with communities to support individuals in the midst of difficult emotional life changes. They currently offer 110 community programs per month, serving over 30,000 individuals per year. The only permanent thing in life is change. Supporting charities dedicated to helping those going through these changes, trials, and tribulations require a never-ending commitment. The onus is on us as creators to affect change through our true, authentic talents, and Into the AM is the model of how this is done. Their clothes are handcrafted with care. They have a team of skilled artisans that craft each garment with the highest quality fabrics and eco-friendly inks. Not to mention, these things don't shrink, they don't fade, and they fit as if they were designed supernaturally. I'm stopped every time I wear one of the graphic tees to find out where I got it. The colors attract attention from miles, and the art is nothing short of spectacular, with designs for everyone. One of my personal favorites, Twilight Midden. Go take a look. End of the AM does all of this while putting their money where their mouth is. 30-day money-back guarantee, lightning-fast shipping, and hassle-free returns. The deals are endless. Graphic tee bundles, discount promo codes. Get over there. Check it out. I'm highlighting the tees. But I'd be remiss to not mention that if you want to walk around in the absolute most comfortable shorts, joggers, and basic tees, hit up into the end. I even wear the basics to the gym. Head on over to thetragedyacademy.com, go to our sponsors tab, and follow the affiliate link to the Into the AM store. Help support Into the AM and the Tragedy Academy by purchasing the absolute best apparel and the best designs ever. And remember, academics, be cool and keep learning.